Larry Magid, CBS News. We've all heard about bullying and cyberbullying, and of course, bullying's been around forever. But things have changed as a result of the internet, mobile phones, social media, and other digital spaces, which are both part of the problem and part of the solution. And one of the people at the front lines of fighting bullying and cyberbullying for the past couple of decades has been Rick Phillips, as CEO and founder of Community Matters, a Northern California based nonprofit organization that works with schools to help them create strategies to combat bullying both on campus and online. I started the interview by asking Rick Phillips to talk about the evolution of bullying over the last 20 years or so. It is an evolving virus, if we might think of it that way, Larry, as a virus that's mutating and changing and morphing all the time. When you and I were boys, bullying was big, thuggier males often stealing your lunch money. And over time, bullying mutated and became something that became more girl-on-girl, took on all kinds of different forms. But what we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years is a spike, a significant spike in electronic aggression. The use of social media to commit acts of mean-spirited behavior. That has been the arc or the evolving uh, arc of, of bullying over these last several years. And how does it manifest itself both in terms of the young person when they're away from school but also the nexus to school. How does it affect what goes on on the campus or around the campus? It makes it all the more complicated because when people can use the Internet and technology and social media from home to spread a rumor, to threaten somebody, to send a compromising photograph, to text people, it's very difficult for the school to know how to respond to that. And there are questions of both legality as well as social responsibility in in dealing with this. So it is a much more complex, complicated process than it was a, a push or a shove in the hallway or three boys, you know, threatening a younger or smaller child. We're now dealing with a 10-year-old who, with the press of a button, can send a vicious or mean-spirited message with very little accountability or opportunity for catching that person. And, and as you know, we have a cherished tradition of free speech, and sometimes one person's speech is another person's bullying. Uh, how does that tie in? I mean, don't, in a sense, people have the right to make mean comments if that's how they want to exercise their First Amendment rights? Well, I think you're right. This has been a dilemma for the schools, and I think as the courts continue to weigh in on this, some of the changes we're seeing is that schools are given been given greater latitude to perceive that if the actions, even if they happen off campus, are a threat to learning and a threat to the institution of public education, then the schools do have a responsibility to take action. And this is putting a little more teeth into the behavior of school administrators as to how to respond. But that's more at the punitive end. What's missing is how to respond more at the preventative end. And and I know that's an area of of strong concern for Community Matters, the organization. So let's talk about that. What are some of the ways that you found that prevents bullying both on campus and by extension uh, online as well? I sort of peel the onion all the way back to make this comment, Larry, that bullying is a social norms issue because the data, as we've come to understand it over these last multiple years, is that on any given day, bullies and the people who are victimized by those bullies may only constitute about 15% of the people in a school building. That really means that as many as 85% of the kids are not engaged in hurting other people or being victimized, but they are engaged because they're watching. And what we have seen is an increase in bystanderism, which in a sense means that if the majority of the people in the building see somebody say or do something mean-spirited and say or do nothing to intervene, their silence is a form of consent, a form of Mm. permission. And what we're seeing then, therefore, is more and more kids perceiving and believing it's okay to do these kinds of things, and it is not expected that people intervene. That's a dangerous thing in a democracy when the majority of its citizens do not participate in taking care of each other. The numbers you give are are certainly within range of, of some of the research that I've read. One can argue what the bullying rate is, but it's certainly much closer to 15% than it is closer to 85%. Yet there is this perception among a lot of people that we have an epidemic of bullying, that it has become a norm. 
And it strikes me that what you're saying and what the researchers are saying is that it's not a norm, but it's perceived as a norm. And I'm wondering what impact that has. Exactly. And I think you're right on the the nexus of that is that if the perception, particularly on the part of young people, that this is the way it is, then they're not going to feel compelled to take action, to report it, to intervene on behalf of somebody else, because in their thinking and their belief system is this is the way it is. It's almost as if we've gotten to a place where it's, among young people, cooler to be cruel then it is cooler to be kind. And it is that separation that we need to close. How do we begin to move the needle, so to speak, Mm -hmm. away from cruelty to kindness? How do we begin to wake up the courage of young people to begin to raise their voices? Because they are in the best position to interrupt to prevent, to de-escalate, and to stop mean-spirited behavior from happening. And by the way, there's actually research backing what you're saying. There's a couple of researchers, I, I know their last names, Perkins and Craig, who did a study in New Jersey where they interviewed kids and found that most kids perceived there to be a big bullying problem in school. But in fact, when they said, have you been a victim of bullying? Most kids said no. And based on that, they actually created a campaign pointing out that most kids aren't cruel. And that actually had an impact on the 15 percent or so that were acting cruelly. It actually reduced the, the incidence of bullying. I can see how that would happen because it it, it really minimizes, it shrinks the belief of the people in the greater community that this is okay or acceptable or normal when, when you're able to do it the way you've just described in that study. So let's talk about the work you do. And, and you, you mentioned the word youth voice or giving, giving, helping young people find their voice. What does that mean and why is that important? Well, I think it's important when we talk about mean-spirited behavior because there's three things I want to say quickly. One is we've tried so much to legislate it away, and we've tried our best to punish kids into being kind, and those three primary strategies have not been very effective, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. So we need a different approach, and that approach has to be to see the young people in our schools as not just the perpetrator, but to see them as the solution. We often say at Community Matters that young people are in the best position to intervene because they see, hear, and know about these things before an adult ever knows about them in most cases. They're able to intervene sooner and earlier than adults can before it becomes an incident. And their behavior so much sets the cultural norms of what's cool or uncool in youth culture. So first to state that young people are powerful, but this is the important point, adults underutilize young people. So youth voice becomes a call to action, Larry, Uh, a a way in which we can begin to have an intention and then a commitment and then a plan to wake up the courage of our young people because they're in the best positions to interrupt it. The question is, how do you do that? How do you begin to engage a population of young people when they live in a world where the media says, you know, don't snitch, don't tell, don't get involved, mind your business, it's not cool to intervene, Snitches lead to stitches. I'll add one more thing, which is that one of the traditional pieces of advice about bullying is tell a trusted adult, which, of course, is probably good advice. But if it begins and ends there, are you missing out on what may be the strongest ally for the person who's being affected, which is their peers? Yes. And often when we tell a trusted adult, which is a good thing to do, by the way, but often it's late in the game. It, it, it's much more effective if, as young people see and hear and know what is wrong, that then they have the tools and commitment and support to speak up and intervene. One of the subtle things that's important to understand in this is that kids are confused by language. You know, when often we we see young people say or do mean things, let's say say mean things, they will often come back and say, I was just kidding. I was just messing with them. I didn't mean nothing by it. Because they blur the lines between what's teasing or playful and what is mean-spirited or what we call a put-down. So part of the strategy here is we've got to give young people a vocabulary and a language that helps them clearly identify right from wrong. Because it is that point at which they, then they have a choice to say, do I want to do something about that? But isn't that contextual, for example, what's appropriate, let's say, at a sporting event or when you're with a close friend or a close group of friends, or even ethnic humor, which could be friendly or endearing among people within the ethnicity? Aren't there kind of innocent things that could be misinterpreted as bullying? 
Yes, there are. And, and I think just having this conversation or understanding that this is the kind of conversation we want to have with young people to help them tease apart those subtleties. It's because you and I know, Larry, that often teasing is something between friends where we can say things to each other as friends that we wouldn't say to a stranger. So helping young people differentiate and discern what is okay and what's not okay, what's appropriate in one group is not appropriate in another group. This is part of the awareness and education that needs to start the process mm -hmm. to build information and knowledge, which then can lead to empathy. And it is the empathy that we want to activate in kids to want to engage in helping somebody else. We need to awaken empathy in our children. So you're saying that it's not just a set of rules or behaviors, but a fundamental attitude that we need to think about. A absolutely. I, I think it's, a, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We have to do it all. We have to provide information. We have to use technology appropriately. We have to have rules and policies in place. But often what's missing is what you referred to earlier as youth voice, that we often see the young people as the problem or the consumer, and we don't see them as the solution and the contributor. And when we can begin to make that paradigm shift, we can begin to reach out to kids and uh, give them some motivation and some reasons and then some tools so they feel more confident and competent to intervene. Because when we ask students, why don't you speak up when you see intolerance or injustice happening in front of your eyes, often kids report it's fear of retaliation. That's not a surprise. The second thing they told us was a surprise was we don't know what to say or do. Hmm. Nobody's given us the skills, the tools, or the support to know what to say or do. So they are telling us what they're looking for is tools, resources, support, encouragement. And we can do that in a structured way. Because at the end of the day, it can cost as much as $75,000 to have one school resource officer, a police officer on your campus waiting for trouble to happen. But it doesn't cost any money to wake up the courage of young people and, and give them the support to become the leaders we wish them to become. That's been the work of Community Matters for the last 15 years, is focusing on helping schools know how to wake up the courage of young people, and then monitor and measure their progress over time so we can see success in what they're doing. So how do you articulate this and who articulates this so that it resonates among the very people who need to hear it? It's a great question, Larry. I think the first thing is you have to identify the what's in it for them. I don't think we can appeal generally to young people's sense of altruism. I think we start with what's important to you. And when we ask young people what's important to them around the issue of bullying and mean-spirited behavior and cyberbullying, what they often say is, I'm concerned about my friends, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my brother, my sister, my cousins. They're concerned about the people they love. So we appeal and say, well, what if we could give you some tools and some support so that you could reduce the likelihood of the people you care about getting hurt or getting in trouble? Would you be interested in learning those things? And what we have heard resoundingly is yes. Yes, 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 regardless of demographics, age, socioeconomic level, is young people want to make the world immediately around them a safer place. They just have been not afforded the opportunity nor the tools to do so. That is the, that is the call to action. But who delivers the message? Is it professionals like you, or is it young people themselves that you enlist to actually deliver these messages? When we do it, we do it through our program, which is called Safe School Ambassadors. What we do is we first understand that if we're going to try to create change, social norms change in a school setting, in a community, we can't, get, we can't mobilize everybody all at the same time. So we look for alpha kids, kids who have been identified as social leaders from the different and uh, disparate cliques and social groups on a campus. So that might include kids who are bullies or perceived as thugs or stoners or other labels placed upon kids. But when you start by recruiting and identifying social leaders, then what we do is we invite them into a conversation about 
giving them some tools to help themselves and the people they care about be safe, they respond yes. Then we train those students because they deserve to be given training and practice and to acquire competence and skills so that they could more safely know what to do when one of their friends threatens somebody or one of their friends says, I'm going to press this button and send this compromising photograph. Look at this. You know, we want kids to say, wait a second, I know you think that's funny, but you're going to get in trouble and it's not okay to do that. So these are things that we can do. These are things that we have done. These are things that are solution-based strategies that are available to us. The question is, do adults have the will and the leadership, Larry, to really invest in youth voice, utilizing safe school ambassadors and other strategies to wake up the courage of kids to prevent, because they're on the front lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're almost out of time. Let's talk a little bit about social media. We've already seen plenty of evidence that social media can become part of the problem, right? People can cyber bully on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we, We know that that does happen. But is social media also part of the solution? It must be part of the solution. You know, if if young people mindlessly or even some mean-spiritedly are using it to hurt, that same tool can be used to help. I think the question here is a moral one, is that we've, we, we, again, we have to engage. It's an important word. We have to engage and we have to empower uh, young people. And once they feel engaged, meaning they own the problem, and once we give them the authority to intervene and the support to do it safely and effectively, they will. They will interrupt messages. They will stop an Instagram that's going out that's hurtful. They will stop somebody from posting a mean-spirited thing on Facebook. Um, And we encourage that. We encourage, look for ways that you as a young person can interrupt, prevent, de-escalate, or stop hurtful things from happening, whether it's in physical time or whether it's in social media time. And young people are eager, ready, and hungry to do so. They're waiting for us. Well, on that note, I think I'm going to have to say our goodbyes. But first, how can people get a hold of you and learn more about Community Matters? The best way to do that is to just go to the website, uh, www.community-matters.org. And there is a wealth of knowledge, resources, information that would support parents, schools, and young people uh, in finding more ways that they can be better citizens and we can create a safer world. Rick Phillips, the founder and CEO of Community Matters, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me.